everybody to Dat Poker Podcast, episode 109, September 20th, 2021. I'm your host, Dave Schwartz, alongside Roscoe P. Coltrane. Hey, poker world. Uh, T. Chan. T. Hello. Uh, Good. I, I was wondering if you forgot Ross's name for a moment, or what, what exactly happened in that <laughs> moment. Okay. I just kind of, I don't know, take different amounts of time to introduce him. Uh, right. And Daniel Legrandu in back in Las Vegas. I see the uh, the vagina art on the background there, so I know you're at home. That is my wife's doing. Okay, she loves this kind of stuff. You should see the one in the bedroom. It's too hot. It's, it's uh, what do you call it? X-rated. But before we start, I wanted to mention one a couple things real quick. Uh, well, this one thing specifically. World Series of Poker is coming up. We're going to talk about that, I know. Um, I did a little staking thing a couple of years ago. Some people got left out. You know, they got refunded because we oversold and all that kind of stuff. And I promised them that, you know, they'd get an opportunity yeah. to get a chance. And they, they are getting that opportunity for this World Series of Poker first. There's 1,500 people that haven't had a chance to get a piece. They will get first dibs. But for everybody else throughout the World Series of Poker, on the daily, watching the vlogs, you're going to have an opportunity to buy a little piece. Um, and I'll give you all the details through Twitter and whatnot when that's available. Not quite yet, but pretty soon. Pretty soon that's going to be up because guess what? The World Series of Poker starts pretty damn soon. Nine days, Daniel. Nine days away. Uh, you've got to be getting pumped. I know it's uh, it's uh, it's Christmas time for, for anybody like yourself that plays all the uh, events at the World Series of Poker. So let's talk about your uh, uh, World Series of Poker. We might as well just jump into it. Um, and the staking program. So you're, how, do you know how much you're going to sell? Have you figured out exactly what the, what's going to happen here? Okay. So I've allocated approximately 2 million in buy-ins. I know that sounds insane, but like we're at, we're essentially what we do with the buy-ins is we, we, we go high. So max amount of events I could play with, there's a 250 K hundred K 50 K with re-entry. So it, in all told, that's like the max we could spend. So essentially when people put up like a hundred bucks, they're going to get something back for sure. Right. You know, even if I bomb, they're going to get something back. It's just, uh, you know, safe. So we've set aside about 25% for them. And then I'm going to set aside some for daily. Because what I've noticed over the years when we've been doing this with the blogs is that, you know, a lot of people, when they start watching the blogs, like, how do I get a piece? And, you know, they don't have that opportunity. So every single day, you know, what you'll have the opportunity to do is watch the vlog, which I must warn you, this year's vlog is going to have some stuff in it. Well, you guys won't care, but some might. This World Series of Poker is happening during hockey season. Yeah. Okay, so forgive me, but my fantasy hockey team is going to be featured. It's going to be featured daily. You're going to see updates on how my team is doing, and uh, that's just it. You're going to, if you don't like it, you just have to fast forward about 15 to 45 seconds. So that's going to be a thing. Um, but yeah, so what we really thought would be fun is essentially release the vlog, right? And then after the vlog's released, let people know to go check out uh, you know, where they can buy the, the, the pieces of me for that day's event. Because what I'll do with the vlog is like, you obviously record it the night before. I'll let people know what I'm playing the next day. So I'll be like, all right, going home, busted tonight. But tomorrow is the 10K Omaha 8. So go there now and sign up. So it'll be fun. It'll kind of be um, we've got, uh, interactive and uh, a good sweat, I think, for a lot of people. It should be interesting to see. You know, the World Series of Poker, there's a lot of unknowns this year in terms of the numbers. I did see something out of, out of Europe. Uh, which is good for the main event. Apparently Europeans will be allowed to travel, those that are vaccinated, but that probably won't be till November 1st. So it will help for the, the very last bit of the World Series of Poker. But uh, before that, I don't know, we shall see. We shall see how it looks. So you mentioned 2 million. Did you talk about percentage wise or did I miss it? Percent, how much of you're actually going to sell off? It's, it's approximately 25% okay. right, with a little bit of rebate. But of, of course, and this isn't part of the package or whatever, but like even before that, I have the super high roller bowl coming up on September 27th through the 29th, which is a $300,000 buying event. Yeah. Not selling pieces for that one, but I will be this week, aside from doing my hockey research, because the best day of the year is Saturday, which is my hockey draft. It's the best day of the year. I wake up early and everything. And this is like the $40 hockey pool you're in every year. It's 60, but it doesn't matter. It's not about yeah. the money, obviously. It's the greatest thing. It's my favorite day of the entire year. I know that's saying that's some, yeah. some people that would be insane, but I'm not actually joking. I get super stoked for it. So I'll be doing the hockey research. I've done a bunch. And then in addition to that, I'm going to be watching back all the Poker Masters final tables. And I'm going to try to see what I can do to prepare because most of those guys that I played with will be the ones I'll be facing in Super High Roller Bowl. So, I mean, I need to, I need to, I need to give myself every edge that I can because there's a hand I want to talk about. You tell me when is a good one to do the hand because it's a well, really well, I want to ask you first, since you mentioned fantasy, of course, you talk about fantasy and talk about WSOP. We're talking 25K fantasy now. 
Uh, I imagine I haven't heard anything about this. So my assumption is there will be no 25 K fantasy pool for the first time in God, almost the entire time I've been playing the world series. It's funny you say that I literally today was like, because it's crunch time now, right? There has been some interest, of course, tomorrow I'm going to send out feelers to the people in 25 K get a gauge for the interest, the numbers. If the numbers don't seem, you know, worthwhile, then I'm going to just postpone. Cause I know David Baker is not going to do his $500 thing, which is a lot of fun adds a lot of buzz to it. So there is a decent chance and we'll know probably by tomorrow, the next day, whether or not uh, we're going to hold it at all this year. All right. You need 10 guys, probably something like that. Yeah. If we get eight, that's plenty, but you know, I want to make sure that we have eight solid, not like, because poker players are hard to wrangle up. You know what I mean? Jesus. And I, it it is stressful for me. I'll be playing the super high roller bowl. I don't need to be, you know, going around doing all this other kind of stuff. And hockey too, right? At the same time. So, um, okay, bus, what's going on with your daily vlogs? Give us the whole World Series Poker Rundown while we're here. Okay, do we want to do the hand now or do we want yeah, to do the hand? Yeah, let's do the hand. For All sure. right, this hand is great. Okay, this hand is great because this hand is a perfect example, absolutely perfect example of how, how you would break down a hand using game theory. Okay, very, very cool. I'm going to explain the hand to you guys. You tell me what you would do in this spot. Okay. Is there a, um, a correct answer here, do you think? There's always a correct answer. There, well, correct. See, see, here's the thing. There is a theoretically correct answer. Of course, you know, nobody plays theoretically perfectly, but actually the player I was up against tries probably harder than anybody to play theoretically perfectly. Okay. Chris okay. Brewer, okay? So the hand happens in the 100K uh, relatively early on where we're very deep. Oh, this is the Poker Go, by the way, the Poker Go Masters. Poker Masters final event. I'm doing quite well to start, you know, I started off okay. Um, and now this hand comes up, the blinds are, you know, 10, 15, with a 15 uh, big blind ante. So the big blind is 1500. I raise under the gun, we're playing six handed tables, six, seven handed. I raise under the gun with two eights, standard to 4,000, okay? Two seats over, Chris Brewer, three bets to 14,000, okay? Comes back to you, standard call, right? You're like, we're 200 something, thousand deep it's just there's really no argument there's like maybe you could say like 1.5 percent of the time you should four bet eights but you really don't do that that's not a good idea you, by the way do you click it do you click the randomizer at this point uh, for that 1.5 percent times that you're gonna no fall? no no i use i don't think most human beings should ever fiddle with stuff like that so if something is like 99 percent and there's a one percent don't bother with it it's just too difficult for the for the mind so just don't worry about it it's not important basically i don't need board coverage with two eights there okay out of position so you can, so I just call. Now there's, the flop, now the flop comes. There's an eight on the flop. I got, there's got to be an eight on this flop. Oh, no, there's no eight on the flop. Okay. okay. It'd be a much flop. easier hand to play. The flop comes queen, queen, seven. I check. He bets third pot. Call. Standard call, right? Just call is just going to be the thing. Okay. Yeah. Turn is another queen. So now it's queen, 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 seven. I yeah. check once again. I check once again, of course. He bets third pot again. Okay. So once again, call. you know, you can't, your hand is way too good to fold. So you standard, you know, standard call. Okay. Now the river is a deuce, complete blank. So your hand is just what it is. Queen to Queens full of eights. You check your opponent bets. Chris Brewer in this case, who is going to be balanced with his bluffs in an overbet spot. He bet twice the size of the pot. He bet two X pot, 150 K into about 75. Okay. So you're sitting there with eights to explain to me both Adam and Terrence and even Ross, how do you, how do you think about this hand and how do you get to what, what to do? So you, he bet 150 into 75 K and you have how much behind? Sorry. Don't worry. That's not relevant. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. He's not raising. So yeah, that's it not relevant. Yeah. Okay. So hmm. question is, is it a call or is it a full? Okay. I'll yeah. go first. Because I'm not a chicken shit and waiting like Ross to wait for Terrence to answer. <laughs> uh, okay, so I guess my first thought is, well, how does how does he perceive Daniel as? Uh, Again, now you're going. Okay, you, you know now what you're doing is you're going away from theory. No, like for you're sure. Already going to exploit. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But I'm, I'm. That's I can't help it. That's how I'm. That's how I play. That's how I'm going to play. How do? How does? How does Chris uh, perceive me as Daniel? Um, ability to call here light. Or well, uh, well, actually, like, I think the thing to think about th- this is here, give, given his sizing, it's, it's obviously a polarized sizing. I don't know if he's polar to a queen or if he also has 
aces or kings because I haven't studied the spot enough the to know spot. this. And maybe maybe Daniel, you can tell me because that because then then we can kind of figure it out whether he's polar to just a queen, which would make it ace king king queen queen jack suited, maybe some queen ten suited in there. I don't remember the positions that you guys w- were in, um, but it would it will obviously have some queens. And but if he the the thing is that if he has a smaller sizing for aces kings jacks tens, um, then I think that changes the answer. But if aces is also the part of a polarized bet, um, then that changes things. So Daniel, I don't know if you know the theoretical answer to that question. So I would think, I would say that what he can two x pot there is a queen, as you mentioned, all mm-hmm. the seated queens that he would three bet, and then you know the ace queen and king queen offs that he three bets. Um, also aces and Kings can Kings can search now, now with Jack's that's far too thin because I can have it, some aces Kings. And of course I can have a queen as well. So I would assume, and I didn't run this, but I would assume it's a four Queens aces and Kings is the only value hands that he's going to have in that spot. Yeah. So he's got, I mean, sorry, can I quickly ask, does he do the same thing with those four? Like, is he going to bet the same sizing with, uh, four Queens aces and Kings? Well, theoretically, what we, when, we, when we talk about an overbet, we say like, so what sort of range can support this overbet size? And he, this is how he thinks, right? And he, know, you know, he understands it. So he's not going to overbet too often. So what a, what a solver will give you as an output is saying, okay, you can overbet 2x pot with a queen, and maybe you do it with aces, maybe kings. That's about it. There's no other um, hand that you would do that with, right? So once he knows that, then yes, he would do that with aces, kings, or queen. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you guys because I want to get back to like, exactly how it's supposed to be broken down and how you think about this spot. Because this is how game theory works. This is the crux of it. This is where all the old school people or whatever who like poo-poo it, they don't understand it's this simple, okay? And it's, it's, it's this easy to start with this baseline. The first question you must ask yourself, right, is what is your defense frequency here, okay? He bet 2x pot. The formula is, is bet, divided, bet divided by pot plus bet, okay? So that's Two over three, 67%, you need to fold. That means you must call with the top 33% of your range to be at game theory, uh, to be at Nash, right? If you call the top 33% of your range every time when someone does that, you can't win, you can't lose, okay? It's just a zero sum thing, right? Now, now that you know this number, this is the important number, the 33%, okay? Now take the hand that you have, two eights. Okay, compare it to all the possible hands you could have in this spot, right? So what hands can I have here? I can have aces, because I might slow play it, kings. I can have jacks. I can have four queens, right? I can have tens, nines, eights. I can have a seven, seven, eight suited, six, seven suited, a seven suited, all possible. I can also have deuces through sixes, right? Less likely though, right? Deuces huh? through sixes are less likely, right? A little bit, sure. But I can have all these hands, be weighted, of course, right? So now the question is this. Now how you break it down is you ask yourself, is two eights in the top 33% of the entire range of hands that I just mentioned? Don't think so. I, I don't think so. I don't know. Well, I mean, like, yeah, that this, while, while you're talking, I'm trying to do this, but it's hard to do a talk at the same time. So, I mean, you have like four, you have, because there's only one queen remaining, you four combos of ace, king, queen, four combos of king, queen, Comes queen jack. So like like that's the thing is is like if I had infinite time, I would probably go through it and go through that. But I don't know where two eights falls in the continuum there. Right. So this is where you ballpark, right? Because you're on a shot clock. Yeah. You've only got thirty seconds. You're obviously you should use a time bank in one of these kind of situations when it when it matters. But essentially, when you I play- suspect it's a fold. My guess is that it's a fold. But so uh, what but would I- be your guess is to be like what is the worst hand that you should call with there? Tens jacks. I yeah. actually. I haven't run it, but I think it's right between tens and jacks. Yeah. Is exactly where it's supposed to be. There's also the slightly beneficial blocking property that he never three bets with queen eight suited, I assume, in this position. And he may three bet with queen jack suited, queen ten suited. No. <laughs> well, yeah, more likely, but he actually, I'll tell you what he had. He had queen nine suited. So okay. he was three betting a little wide. People do that a little more. The ranges you see people employ in live tournaments, because there's a big blind Annie, which is big, people play more aggressive. Like you see a guy like Michael Adamo, who I'm sure we'll talk about, plays a lot more hands because of the big blind hand. He's defending really, really wide, opening wide. A guy like Ali Amshurovich, I never see him fold King X suited in any circumstances. I've never seen in 20 years of poker. In 20 years of poker, I've never seen a guy win more pots with King 5 suited, King 6 suited, King 2 suited. Like 
he just does not fold these hands, right? So I'm actually going to look do some research on that because I thought I'm a little curious what, what that when you see that and you see a guy having the success he has, how does that how does that rub off on you? Well, I look. I want to look into it. I'm going to go into the lab myself, and I, I have to assume a couple things. Number one, well, obviously he's very confident in his post post off play, and he's found a, a class of hands that most people discard as not valuable, but he must have found uh, some added value. And I think I understand it. I don't want to give away too much uh, as to why, but uh, they actually play pretty fine in position, these hands, like King eight suited, King seven suited. I saw David Peters doing it too a little bit. Um, and a lot of it, I, thought, I think a lot of it has to do with just big blind Annie. And, uh, and yeah, and like, like a King seven suited doesn't play nearly as bad as you would think. It actually in some ways gets you in less trouble than a seven suited. Hey, speaking of King seven suited, it could be possible that if you run the simulation here, that if you had King seven suited, that's a call, but pocket eights is not, even though eights is better than sevens because King seven suited blocks King queen. Um, that so, that, that, so that's an interesting thing. So when you say the top 33% of the hand, you do have to consider blocker effects too. Like there is a, there is a chance that you would, you would fold eights, oh, but call yeah. King seven suited. No, you're, so you're absolutely right. So what you do is you first figure out the number, which is 33%. Second thing you do is ask yourself, does this hand rank in the top 33%? And then you're like, yes. But then you realize, oh, but wait. Remove blocker. blocker effects actually make this a bad call or a good call. So for those that like, I don't know, that want to go down that road of learning modern poker theory, that's like really sort of the basic fundamental um, way in which you would deploy it in those simplest. And I thought this was a really good example because it's so clear. It's either like, you know, it's just a full house board, right? So you have, you know, like what pair can you call with? What's the worst pair you can call with in this spot? Um, I want. I will say this: in the hundred k, I was. I can't. I don't know what happened. I woke up on. I was trying really hard, but made four mistakes in about four hours, and that's oh, that's way too many. Like two is too many. Four big mistakes like this one, where I called with the eights, thinking that I was in the top thirty three percent of my range when it's not even close, really. So made a couple big mistakes. Didn't you know? I didn't deserve to win the purple jacket based on how I played the hundred k. So unfortunate but here's the thing you know i get home i beat myself up over it a little bit if i get home i'm like all right well you know what you make mistakes such as life you're gonna you're gonna learn from them and you're gonna take your time a little more because i didn't use a time bank to actually do the math on it i just ballparked it and figured eights was okay against chris but it's just it's just a fold i'm basically so that what that means is if you start calling with eights you're calling too often against overbets so then we can get adam's brain working with the exploits right so when you see a guy call with eights right now you go aha He's overcalling against overbets in this spot. So now you can take more of your value hands and overbet and start to gut some of your bluffs against a player like that. That's where the game is beautiful, right? It's game theory, but it's still poker. It's still like, oh, I see what this guy did. I'm going to do this as a result. But that's also a leveling game too, because I may reverse it now, you know, and start way overfolding because he saw that. You get it? So that's where you get dangerous with like, when you veer too far one way or the other from game theory, you know, to exploit the other person and it becomes obvious the other person, they re-exploit you back. So that's just sort of like a leveling war you don't want to get involved in too much unless you feel like, you know, you're one step ahead. And for and for those wondering what the bluffs are, because some people might be like, oh, there's no bluffs on this this queen, 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 seven deuce board. Absolutely wrong. Uh, King, King Jack is probably, I think, King the Jack. most obvious bluff um, on, on this people. Yeah. So, and he's uh, also going to bluff Ace King there. Yeah. Because a King Jack and Ace King are very good bluffs because yeah. he blocks aces, kings, and of course, ace, king, king, queen with, with both those hands. But King Jack is the, is the primary bluff. And I can promise you this Chris Brewer is going to bluff when he has those hands. He is going to do it. Okay. Like I've seen him do it, I've seen him do it many, many times. So I thought maybe he might be actually over bluffing in this spot. So, which extended my calling range a little further. Oops. Nope. He had a queen. So, such so that actually um, brings us to the poker series that you have currently on the YouTube channel. I know people watching on YouTube here probably don't need to hear this, but those uh, listening to the podcast uh, version of this show, uh, head on over to Daniel's YouTube uh, channel because there's a couple of videos and I don't, uh, I want to get your um, sort of plan for this, but you've got some modern poker theory videos that you've done recently. Yeah, what we did was, well, Christian, my guy, I, I played a 25K on GG Poker uh, at the, during the World Series. And I, it was one of the best events I'd ever played in terms of, you know, I was explaining all my decisions and I was making really good decisions, some good bluffs. So Christian edited it down to several 30 minute videos, 20, 30 minute videos where, we, you know, you basically get to hear the analysis as I break down these hands. And basically, you know, the title for the video is like 
using modern poker theory to, um, you know, make good decisions. Kind of like we talked about with the eights, you know, ask yourself, all right, what's the best possible hand I can have here? A queen, aces, kings, and then you go down the line and go, okay, well, how far down the line do you get to before you get to your hand? And if you go too far, <laughs> guess what? It's not a call. Now, obviously in that hand with Chris Brewer, bet size matters. Bets, uh, bet size matters, right? So if he only bet pot, Okay, now you do the equation and you say, okay, well, against the pot size bet, I need to call with bet over pot plus bet 50%. So now I can call it the top 50% of my range. And I think eights is okay there, right? So that's the interesting thing about poker. Like, you know, it's not as simple as like, you should just call with this hand. Depends how much the guy bets, you know? You can't just call no matter what the bet is. Unless you're playing limit hold'em. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Which you will be doing soon. Uh, Which I will be doing soon. I am actually, I did actually book a flight to Vegas. It felt totally weird to actually like go on the internet and book a plane ticket somewhere. I know Daniel's been doing it, but it was my first time since. I haven't um, done it once. Well, okay. Somebody books your flights for you. Fine. I didn't book a flight. I never flew anywhere. I took a private plane. That's not a, you don't. All right. Yeah. <laughs> You're, you're, okay, fine. But I, 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 the, I'm, the unwashed mass oh. is me. I went to the internet, typed my name in a bunch of fields, typed in my credit card numbers and I booked a flight and I'm trying to, and, and I'm going to, I'm only going to be there in Vegas for like four or five days, play a couple events, play a little bit, get a feel for things and see some friends and stuff like that. But it was a weird feeling. And then I realized I have no fucking idea how this COVID thing works. Like I'm probably going to have to get a COVID test before I go down to the States. So I start Googling that. And then I'm like, wait, how do I actually play in the world series? Which uh, I guess could be our, our, our next topic is uh, because as we talked about last week, the vaccinations will be required and you'll be required to, to prove your vaccination. And I was like, well, how do I do this? And so I started looking up uh, some, some information and then the app well, downloaded. Yeah. And for today, it's been, you know, let's get into this, I guess, while we're talking about it and I know we're out of order, but we'll get back into it. Uh, the World Series of Poker is we're, I, we're not out of order. The order is just a thing no that you order. made up. No the, the order is just a thing that you made up. <laughs> yeah. I gave you I gave you a beautiful segue. Can you see how uncomfortable I am that we're out of order? <laughs> uh, so nobody at home can see the order. Only we can see the order. Yeah. The World Series of Poker is nine days away. Uh, it is kicking off with the, uh, as it always does, with the casino employees event. And actually, usually the casino employees event has, I want to say it has its own day usually. Or maybe they only have one event. Anyway, there's. There's uh, a few events first day and uh, for Canadians. And, and so, you know, the, the talk has been, what's the attendance going to be like? You must be vaccinated to play in the world's Series of poker. They've lifted the mask mandate. So you don't have to have a mask if you're going to play for all you people who it's driving you crazy that you have. Well, a mask. You, you, you have to have a mask when you're walking around. Yeah, you so when you're at the table, you don't need a mask. Yeah. Because you have to prove you're fully vaccinated, et cetera. Anyway, uh, I don't want to spark a billion YouTube comments, but whatever. Uh, so, uh, but the concern for the size of these events has been, what's the international situation going to be like for people who are going to travel to the World Series? Because as we know, a large percentage of these fields is made up by Canadians, Germans, English, French, uh, you know, people from Europe, all over the place. Now, people from Australia, New Zealand, they're not coming. They're not allowed out of the country. So they're not going anywhere. Um, so that's going to take a hit. And um, recently, as Daniel pointed out earlier in the show, um, from Europe, you're going to be able to come over and starting in November. So the last half of the World Series, you're going to have uh, maybe, you know, and who knows if the people are going to come and, and if the situation changes or whatever. But it seems like the Europeans are going to be able to come over uh, before. But Terrence, you mentioned it. And from for Canadians going down. So uh, from my understanding, because uh, the old co-host of, of mine, Mike Johnson and myself and Reno Doc are considering coming down, playing for the senior, playing in the seniors event at the end of October and having some fun and being there for a few days. Um, but so to go down, we've got to be, um, uh, we've got to have a negative COVID test before we go, which is fine. We can all get tested here. No problem. Um, but coming home, if we have, we have to have a test within, I think it's three days of coming home, Terrence. So if you test positive, if you go down there, even though you're vaccinated, there's a chance you could get COVID and you test positive within, you know, when you go to get your test and it's going to cost you some money to do it, whatever but you're going to have to isolate for 14 days in Las Vegas in a hotel room, right? So um, before you can come home and get another test. So that's serious, right? Like, what? yeah. You, you, in Vegas. I can't isolate at home. I, I, I'm pretty sure I can isolate at home, right? 
Oh, so good point. Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, you're not in Vegas anymore. Yeah. When you come back to Canada, you go yeah. home. Right, right. Yeah. I was like, I didn't sign up for this. But you have to, but you have to isolate for 14 days. Right? Yeah. I mean, I would anyway, because I have a three-year-old and no, you know, she's obviously not vaccinated. So, you know, you know right. Put anyway. yourself in the, jo- in the position of somebody like myself who has a job, right? Yeah. So I come home and I can't, you know, go to work for two weeks because I'm isolated at home. That's a that's making me not want to go. So I don't think mm-hmm. I'm going to go down to the World Series because of of the situation. If I get something, you still go to work in an office, Jesus. Yeah. Well, yeah. So <laughs> on the vaccine thing, I did mention on the last podcast, and this created a little bit of a brouhaha. And yeah. one of the people reached out to me to ask me to clarify what you know what was going down here. And it was when I was talking about Rob Mizraki and Will Faila, who were at the <laughs> win poker tournament when we were playing at the wind this was mask you know mask free there was nobody wearing any and will is sitting there you know filling out a vax card okay and rob's there too do you know so here's the thing here's what i want to make clear neither rob as far as i know i know rob for sure isn't he was not selling vaccine cards to anybody like that apparently according to him it was like a joke to him he was just kidding but he did say that after the conversation we had at the table there that he, he made the decision to actually go get vaccinated. So he went and got the Johnson and Johnson, but he is not selling vax cards. Um, and he, he said he threw it away right there. Like, cause you know, Will's like, Oh, here you go, buddy. But there was no like black market of, of vax cards as far as I know. So I don't know if that, if that alleviates some of the, the heat on Rob. Cause he's like, a lot of people are asking, you know, like what I'm doing with these vax cards. I'm like, yeah, I didn't say you were selling them, but I guess, you know, it's that game of broken telephone where it comes out that way. There's no question that Will had fax cards there and he was writing shit on them. That's what I saw happening, right? I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, bro? You can't do that shit. So, yeah. But anyway, Rob is vaccinated, not selling fax cards, and he's going to be at the World Series of Poker playing a lot of them. Yeah, it has to be a game of telephone because there's absolutely no chance for Rob Mizraki watches this podcast to get the... To get it. <laughs> Although, if, yeah, so yeah, if you get your Johnson and Johnson, you'll be you'll be two weeks away from playing in the World Series of Poker, which is which is well, I've seen I've seen a lot of uh, tweets of that nature of people who are like, eh, maybe I'll get it, maybe I won't get it. They do end up getting it because they do want to play in the World Series of Poker. I think you said last week, Daniel, that Mattisau was kind of on that list of people who want to play the World Series and uh, were a little vaccine skeptical, but wanted to do he it. it already. He he'd already gotten the vaccine. Oh, he'd already gotten it. Okay, I like, thought literally he- the only reason Mike Mattisau was alive today. Like literally almost for sure. The only reason he is alive is because he got the vaccine. Okay. He's like as high risk as they get. Yeah. You know, he was vaccinated. He went to a UFC fight, got the Delta variant and he said it crushed him. Obviously, you know, he had very serious, you know, issues with it. But like, I, I mean, listen, I don't know for a fact that the vaccine saved his life, but I, I can imagine like it made, I mean, I would, I would, I would, I'm again, I'm not a scientist or a doctor, but the stats are pretty damn clear that uh, it likely helped a lot, which is weird because like, you know, the thing probably saved his life. He spends a lot of time shitting on the whole concept. So, so you're going to have to upload your vaccine information. Um, you know, we, there, there is some discussion in the, in the world about, in the poker world about how these are being verified. And, and to my understanding, there is an app called clear and that's what the WSOP has partnered with. You have to install this clear app on your phone. And I think from there, they get you to verify your identity, upload your vaccine card. The question is, and I don't think that there is a definitive answer to this is how, to what extent the, this app clear actually verifies that this is a real vaccine card and not something you got from Will Fela. Um, the funny thing is I was not able to actually download this app. So I don't know what, because it says when I go into the play store, it says you, this, this app is not available in your country. Yeah. I tried it for Mexico too. And it, it doesn't work. From yeah. there. But once you get here, you know, it'll open up for you. We used it also for the hockey games for contact tracing and stuff like that. Um, but it's as simple as basically what you need to do. Is your ID, as you said, you take a picture of the Vax card. The, the claim Clear is making, and I need to get more clear answers on this. The claim they are making is that they can verify the number on the Vax card with the actual person to ensure that nobody's faking. I heard from other people saying that's not a thing where they actually don't have that capability, but I think that's kind of important, right? Like, if you're actually going to have a policy like this, you need a way to enforce it that's better than just uh, asking people to call Will Faila. <laughs> so uh let's talk about the world series while we're here um give us uh you know uh, your thoughts terrence first off you know uh, we've got this uh ban on international travel people aren't going to come uh we've got the vaccine is mandatory um 
you know, we're talking about field sizes. We're, we're not too far away from people who are saying there's going to be 10,000 people in the main event. Well, that's not clearly not happening. Um, what are we going to see in your opinion, Terrence, with, uh, with field sizes at the world series this year? I think, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's not going to be anywhere close. I wouldn't be surprised if they are really quite low. I mean, with the, the, these, you know, Daniel mentioned good news coming for Europeans in November, but that doesn't do anything for the prelim events. I don't think very many Europeans are going to spend 14 days in Canada or Mexico so that you could get into the United States, which is currently what you would have to do. So, I mean, I think numbers of being like half of the last World Series of Poker seems like a reasonable number. I don't even know. And that's a really big margin of error. I, I wouldn't want to like bet or take action on anything resembling that number, but I, I think it's going to be small. I mean, I, I don't, the U S fully vaccinated in the United States, something like 55%. If I remember correctly, I can't remember what it is right now. I'll, I'll look it up while we're talking, but even in the United States, it's, it's only like 55%. Um, I will say this though. I wonder how many poker players have, and I know of several that have actually gone in. Like I look at the Raiders games, yeah. the Raiders did the Raiders here in Las, Las Vegas what they did was they basically said, you know, you don't have to wear a mask in the stadium, right? As long as you're vaccinated, okay? If you're not vaxxed, right? You can get vaxxed on site, okay? Wear a mask, go inside, and then, you know, once two weeks clear, you're, you know, you're good to go once you're fully vaccinated. They had 6,000 people, 6,000 people that day sitting in the 110 degree heat to try to get into the Raiders game. So when you actually put a carrot that's of value to some people that they have something they actually want to do, it actually can motivate a lot of people that were like anywhere near the fence. Obviously those that are like, you know, like Alex, obviously Alex Foxen is not going to be getting vaccinated under any circumstances to play the world series of poker, but there's plenty of people that are kind of like, I think Rob was perfect example. When I sat talking to him at the win, he's like, I don't know. I'll just wait and see, you know, what happens with it in a year. And I was like, but then once, you know, once the world series of poker is a thing, he wants to play it for those people. I think it, it could sway a decent amount. So I wonder I wonder how many poker players that can play, that could play, will choose not to get the vaccine and not that, that would want to play that won't because of the vaccine. I think that number is probably less than 15%. Having said that, I agree with Terrence that it'll be down. I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing right around 30% the numbers will be down. That's where I have it at. Okay. So yeah, yeah. I'm thinking like half the field sizes of the 2019 World Series and you're thinking 70% of the that size uh obviously i hope your your number's right and you're right that i think people we talked about this just now but people will be vaccinated because they want to play world series poker but don't forget you're not fully vaccinated until two weeks after your second dose and so and and if there's a four week gap between your first and second dose if you're not getting johnson and johnson for whatever reason because johnson johnson only available in the united states and i believe and maybe some other countries but most other countries you're talking about getting two doses, four weeks apart, and then two more weeks. Well, I mean, even if you decided today, right now that you're going to get fully vaccinated for the world series, that gets you ready. That gets you into the main event, but it doesn't get you into any prelims really. Right. Uh, Daniel, give us uh, your streaming schedule or your, it's not your streaming schedule. Sorry. Your <laughs> vlog schedule. <laughs> It'd be bad to stream that one. Uh, your, uh, your vlog schedule. Do you, do you got the motorhome set up? What's, uh, how, what's, what's happening? Well, yeah, like I said, it's just going to be the same as every year, just different because there's going to be hockey involved, but it'll be a vlog every day. You know, every day uh, I'm playing an event, I'm doing the vlog. I will have the RV. Apparently our RVs are located in a different section across the other building, something about COVID protocols or whatever, but um, it'll be interesting because it won't be hot out, right? Like it'll be okay, Ugh. but you know, you won't, you won't be like dealing with 110 degree heat. So I don't know. It'll be, and there'll, there'll also be like lots of stuff going on during, in town. So I wonder how many people would uh, drop in, if you will. Like, you know, that's, it'd be an interesting test to see like, cause there's a lot of conventions in town. There's a lot of people in for, for, for the Raiders games and whatnot. Like how many of those people will venture over to the Rio and play some of the world series poker events. Uh, I imagine there'll be, you know, more than a few, but yeah, the vlog, we'll see how, I don't know what it's going to look like. All I know is that at the table, I won't be wearing a mask. I won't have to wear a mask. But then when I walk around, I will. So there might be some, you know, masked, you know, video of me. Uh, it's going to be so weird to be at the World Series of Poker and like, you yeah. know, bust out of the tournament at 3 p.m. and walk to my car and it'll just be like, oh, it's it's 75 degrees. 
I don't, I, I don't have to die to get into the car. That's actually like 190 degrees because it's been baking in the Rio parking lot for the next four hours. It's, it's going to be amazing. I'm going to, I'm going to like go out and do things when I'm not playing poker. It's going to be amazing. World series of poker in, in October every year. Let's one time. It'll be the last world series of poker, the Rio too, which it'll be a weird one. Um, because like no spect no spectators, I think is going to be the thing that will feel weirdest. It'll feel probably especially weird to Daniel, because if you've ever seen Daniel, at the world series of poker, there's always a big giant rail behind him. Um, doesn't matter where he's playing, but especially if he's on a table close to the rail that you always just see this huge crowd and people trying to get his autograph and, and pictures in between hands after he folds his hand and stuff. And people trying to get him as he's taking a piss on a, on a 20 minute break and stuff like that. But I think it'll feel really weird, Daniel. I don't know how you think about this to, to be at the world series, to be in that, that pavilion or that Amazon room yeah, and, I don't uh, think it's and be like no that. spectators. I don't, I don't think that's the case. They've already said they, when they really? said that, they said limited, right? Limited spectators or whatever. I don't think they're going to have a way to police that. Right. Because people can walk around wearing a mask in the Rio. Right. You know, to enter the pavilion, they're not going to ask you, are you playing? You know, they're not going to ask each person. If you know, though, there's a lot of people like, you You know, you're you're, you know, like, uh, you know, my my girlfriend, my father in law. Right. Like she'll, he'll he'll be one of those guys who if he sees a sign that says no spectators, he's going to be like, oh, I don't know. But if, if there was not that sign he would probably just walk in because a lot of people don't know that on a regular world series poker, you're just allowed to go in and watch because that's one of the most common questions that I've probably had from people who don't play poker is, Oh, can you just like show up and watch the, can you watch the world series of poker? Like, Oh, you're playing the world series of poker. Can I come watch you? I'm like, yeah, it'll be boring as fuck, but you can, if you really want my to. Guess, my There's guess. a lot of those people, Daniel. I, I don't, you know, Here's the thing. my guess is that at the outset, it might be stringent, but as time goes on, this is just my guess. Yeah. That things going to get lax and people get comfortable i think that's going to be the case with mask wearing i saw that during the whole poker masters right where like on the first day everybody's wearing a mask and for the most part wearing them the way they're supposed to be worn and then you know by the third tournament and fourth it's like you have people either just wearing them on their chin wearing them only on their mouth not their nose not wearing them at all like ali didn't wear one the first week at all he just he had a chin strap he never put it on of course alex fox and brings a so Alex, he brings a face shield, which is also permitted, which is kind of silly because, but he won't even wear the face shield properly. He would wear the face shield up so that it doesn't block his breathing. You know, it's like, so it was like, just like anything that that's a little bit of a concern, right? Because um, people do get comfortable and people do get lax. This idea that every time you move tables, you're going to be sitting at a table without a mask. And then from, to move from table seven to 20, you got to put a mask on sit down at the table, take your mask off. Like policing that, handling that very, very strictly. I don't think that's going to be all that easy to do. And I think that, you know, with time, it'll start to get lax. And if it gets too lax, then it'll go back to the other way it was, where it's like, all right, guys, you got to be militant about this. Because I remember Paul, the tournament director at the RA, was doing his best. And at one point he had to stop one of the tournaments. And he said, guys, I don't like it just as much as you do. But we're getting hammered by surveillance we're getting hammered by people on social media and, and et cetera et cetera it's like these are the rules i didn't make them but we got to follow the rules like they'll they don't care if it's a 50k 100k they will dq you they will kick you out for doing this sort of stuff and then you know people did put their masks on for about half an hour and then after that uh you know they forgot again a little bit for the most part but i don't know it was a weird it's a weird dynamic because nobody ever said anything which i thought was interesting like certain people would just have it hang and nobody nobody said anything you know, nobody really cared, I guess. It's like, but there are some people that were very village vigilant about it. They were very careful. Obviously, there's the weird thing of like, well, what about when you're eating? So when you're eating, you take it off, right? Because how can you eat with the mask on? So I don't know. I think for a lot of the players, they just saw it as like, all right, mutual respect thing. We all wear it. And for others, they said, fuck that. I don't want to wear it. I'm not going to, I don't want to wear it properly. I'm not going to wear it properly. And we it's saw that on the streams too. Yeah, it's it's a funny thing because I mean most poker players I know have probably lost like thousand dollar chips out of their pockets. I'm gonna be damned if I like I've lost so many masks during this pandemic that have just like fallen out of pocket. I'm gonna have to like stuff like ten extra ones in my backpack because I'm not gonna get DQ'd because I I like all my masks fell out of my pocket. Well, they're gonna have masks on site. They did have it right. in the studio. So Daniel, I'm curious as to your mental and physical sort of uh, state going into the World Series of Poker. You've been playing. Well, the GG, you played the World Series of Poker, uh, World Series of Poker online at wsob.com. You've been down 
uh, in Mexico. Um, it's sort of been a long sort of stretch here of, of poker tournaments and playing poker for yourself. Uh, you know, streaming them as well. That takes a lot out of it because you're talking for five, six hours when you're on those. Um, and we're hitting like a stretch of World Series of Poker events that can take it out of you. Like we watch the vlogs every year and we can see sort of, you know, your mental swings up and down with how you're dealing with, you know, some of the bust outs and the long hours and that kind of stuff. And yeah, you're venting. I get it in the vlog, but I'm curious as to what you think your, your sort of current um, you know, if you've been working out, if you're, you're feeling really good physically, mentally, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm an emotional guy and I've went on a weird run. And as I said, for probably two years of all, just like losing my like an unfair share of all ends. So I did this, I did something stupid at poker masters, maybe stupid, but I was just curious. So every single time I was all in or my opponent was all in, I tracked it and I tracked the total number. I won. And I did for me compared to what I had been doing. I won 38, lost 44, and tied three. Now, this- Wait, the coin flips? No, this is every time we were all in. So that'll include sometimes I had jacks, they had eights. I yeah. haven't run it yet, but I'm gonna do like what my average equity was, but I can, I can guarantee you, because I, I mean, I've looked at the hands, I've logged them all, that I was well over 50%, right? So I ended up hitting about 45%, which isn't terrible. That's pretty, you know, close to standard deviation, but I was just curious anyway, because my mind is like, you know, I've been, I've been feeling this for a long time. I want to be like, okay, is this really happening? And I know it'll shift. I mean, it's just a weird phenomenon. As far as like my game, I feel good about how I'm playing for the most part. I still make some mistakes here and there as I did in the hundred K, but I feel ready there physically. That's a, interesting. You asked that I'm 47 now. And I guess for all those of us that are 40 and Terrence, uh, I guess you'll, are you not 40 yet, right? Terrence? Oh, I am. Oh, you are. So you must experience this too then. So I've been working out pretty regularly for two, three years now, right? Pretty consistently. I've never really taken three, four weeks off. Second half of Cabo through Poker Masters basically didn't have no, I didn't really work out. I didn't have time to work out. And I did today for the first time. I worked out. I did a, an actual full workout. And not only can I see the difference, but I feel the difference is significant in terms of the muscle mass, like my strength losses and like, it's, I get when you're over 40, it's harder to, it's a little bit harder to build muscle. It's way easier. But what happens is it's, if, if you don't work out for like two weeks or something, you lose it way fast. Like for a 19 year old, you know, whatever they have, like they cannot work out for a month. They'll be about the same over 40, take three weeks off and you see the difference. So, so that's something that I'm going to try my best to, I'm not going to have like a hardcore workout schedule, but I'm going to make sure that I'm, you know, doing stuff when I, when I have free time. Yeah. It's, it's even stronger, I think for they've studied this. And I think it's even stronger for cardiovascular stuff is that if you take time off the cardiovascular stuff declines even faster than the strength stuff. So strength stuff as, as, as hard as it is to hold on to, as you mentioned, it's actually worse for the uh, endurance and the cardiovascular. Strength. I haven't done any cardio in a long time. So maybe that I'll check. Well, I mean, like, you know, you, you're still going to do some cardio. If you do, if you do 10, 10 pull-ups, that that's kind of cardio. It doesn't make sense. Your heart rate's going to hit 150. You know, you're doing, you're doing lots of squats, you know, you're doing, you know, that kind of thing. There's not just because you're not on a treadmill doesn't mean you, you don't do any cardiovascular work. You walk up a few flights of stairs i'm sure yeah. you know. indeed uh all right uh the poker world uh lost one of its champions this week and uh i want to quickly talk about one well, uh, you know as much as everybody wants to talk about but norm mcdonald passed away um from cancer and and those uh, around the poker world and spent any time in sort of um you know some of the uh you know trip norm would go down to the uh the poker stars event in the caribbean and um, you know, and he was also an online player, an avid online player, and did, of course, famously did the uh, commentary for uh, High Stakes Poker, the final uh, season of the High Stakes Poker before Poker Go revived it. Um, and Norm was, uh, you know, very close to the poker community, had friends, and spent a lot of time playing poker, loved the game, was a great ambassador for the game. Um, and, you know, but beyond that, Norm, it, it, for me personally, Norm was the, my favorite comedian of all time. Norm gave zero fucks about what um, audience thought about him. Um, he, he certainly cared about what people thought of, you know, people close to him thought about him, but his whole thing was, you know, um, just doing the things that he thought was funny. And it showed in, in all the things like he would buy like, famously. I mean, I, I'm sure I'm telling, but those who don't know, maybe, you know, he bombed on purpose in roasts and, and would just do the worst jokes possible to try and see what would happen. And he, but he was also had some of the funniest bits 
you know, for me that I've ever seen, like in comedy, just have me in tears. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. Um, Norm was, uh, again, just a, a great asset to the book community. I was lucky enough to um, interview him once uh, on the old show that we had. And one of my proudest moments was making Norm Macdonald laugh in, in a in the interview we had and for those that remember he was on week uh, he was on saturday night live and he did the weekend update and he would always work he tried not all, i mean he was known for just butchering uh, oj simpson during the trial and of course that's how he ended up getting fired because oj's buddy was the uh, an executive at at nbc and he couldn't take it anymore watching each week norm is <laughs> butchering it, o, oj um but he used to have this thing where he thought crack whore was the funniest the funniest title funniest word one of the funniest words he ever thought so we're in doing the interview and we're asking about online poker and if he plays online poker and i said oh is your poker stars uh online poker you know is your online screen name crack whore and he thought that was funny and i was just like so proud of myself that i made norm chuckle a little bit but he was i mean again he was such a great ambassador for the game and such a sad loss battling cancer for several years without telling anybody um, I don't know what you guys thought and, and if you sort of, um, you know, thought the same things that I did, Terrence, w were you a fan of, of Norm? Yeah. I mean, I think the first word that comes to mind is just the authenticity. Um, he had no ability to be fake. And, and you sort of say, you, you touched on it when you said the, the, you know, go bomb on purpose that he would, it doesn't matter whether he was on stage or not, he was still the same guy. And I think that's what made him funny in his acts is that, you know, it's just like this this weird uncle humor, um, but just done to such perfection and and such brilliance. But the, the main thing is like he of all the celebrities that, you know, have played poker that has sort of crossed over. He I, I loved him because he was such a degen, right? Like he was clearly just just a one of us degen. Uh, and that, and that you just, you just saw that all the time. Uh, and, and that was great. Like he, he loved betting. He, you know, he, I don't even know if maybe he even had a gambling problem he might have, to be honest, like, uh, but it was, it was fun. I only got to meet him like a couple times and, and very briefly. So I definitely didn't have the exposure that, that you guys would have. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, to, to the impact that, the way that he touched people's lives was really evident on Twitter and just how much people enjoyed him, how much people enjoyed being around him, listening to him and, and the comedy. And yeah, it was fantastic. Just, just real, real sad to wake up for that one the other day. Yeah. So speak, speaking to what Adam said about his humor style, if you haven't yet, YouTube, the moth joke. The <laughs> moth joke. I think, I think that's probably had like 20 million views this, this yeah. week. The moth joke is, and I, I don't want to spoil it for you, but just look for the moth joke. And the moth joke for poker version, he did one, he did something similar. I mean, I'm sure this is part of his shtick. At, at the Bahamas, at the PCA, Stapes and Ledlow and those guys, they put together a comedy show and Norm said, he, you know, he'd do it. So he was, of course, the headline. So, you know, you had a few comics go up. He shows up, okay? He, you know, it was a big, big crowd. Everyone's there, everyone in poker, they're all excited. Norm shows up to the mic and goes, uh, so... Uh, I got two kings there. <laughs> That's good. Immediately, like the, the audience were, I was there. This is the Bahamas, Braves, right? And, uh, yeah. And the guy Rays is there, so uh, I got two kings. And uh, I raise. And, uh, and he just told a fucking poker hand for like 20 minutes. It was. Uh, but it was like, it was actually, you know, little bits and fun. But it was like, you know, it's a, it's a slow moving joke, right? It takes time, but there's so many jokes within it. And part of me is wondering, like, what the fuck's he doing right now? But that's kind of like part of the humor, right? You're like, whoa, whoa. It's, it's not, he was so unique and so different from people who just have a joke where they have a setup and they have the punchline and it all just sort of happens within a little, you know, part of the bit. Sometimes his, he just goes and like the, the whole, the, the, the part of the funniest part about it is like, you're wondering, is he just, is he rambling? Did he forget what he was saying? Or is he just like, is this all by design, you know, in his brain? And I think it was, I think he was kind of a genius when it came to that stuff you know, and, and his uniqueness and stuff. But you're right. Like if you looked at Twitter and you saw the outpouring for him specifically, like nobody has a bad word to say about that guy. You know, he kind of came into poker, like you said, and didn't act at all like a celebrity. Didn't expect you wouldn't have known. Like if you just sat down at like some $1,500 World Series event and like it, it wasn't for the fact that everybody's treating him differently, you wouldn't but know. You would be hanging out. Like I remember when we had the suite at the World Series, like I'd go to the poker royalty suite before I had a trailer or whatever. He'd just be always hanging out there with Gavin. And whatever, and just like, you know, shooting the shit, laying on the couch, just like he lived there or whatever. But 
Yeah, he never he never came off like I don't think he I really don't think he viewed himself as like a celebrity that is worthy of other people's praise. I don't think he just was a guy, you know, like and he happened to be really fucking funny. And, you know, he's just a, a fun guy to be around. <laughs> you mentioned the moth joke, and that was certainly one of my favorites. But I think my favorite was he did a joke on uh, I can't remember if it was it was in the John Stewart show. And uh, he was talking about Steve Irwin. Remember, Steve Irwin was the crocodile hunter or whatever. And it was literally the day after Steve Irwin died. He got, you know, remember, like, it was like, um, was it? He, uh, he I got stung by a, a, a ray, a yeah, manta ray or something. Like, they, that's what killed him. And, and uh, Norm's like, yeah, I, uh, some people were telling me that the 42-year-old crocodile hunter was, has died. Can you believe it? And he's like... 42 seems like a ripe old age for a crock. <laughs> yeah, I totally believe it. That, that makes sense to me. And then he goes, you know, who's got to be the most upset. It's the crocodiles. Cause they're, you know, they'll be talking about, you'll never believe who died. And, and uh, one of the other crocodiles says, who got him, Frank? <laughs> yeah. I went, I went down a big Norm McDonald, like uh, video hole. And I, what I kind of realized is he, he was definitely like the comedian's favorite comedian, but he could do every type of, of like stand-up comedy that like imaginable. He could do like stories. He could do like bits. He could do amazing one-liners. Like he, he, he could do everything. But I was curious if, if we knew any, any Norm Macdonald's uh, gambling stories. I have, I know a couple of rumors, but. So Norm, Norm loved to play sit and goes. From what I remember, he just played sit and goes all the time. That was his thing. He didn't, I mean, he'd sit in a cash game, I think, from what I remember, but he loved to play sit and goes. So he'd sit on poker stars playing $50 sit and goes, you know, endlessly. He told us the stories about it, but I don't have any sort. I mean, I know him and Artie Lang were gambling and betting on sports and stuff and doing stuff like that. But um, yeah, no, I don't have any specific. The, the rumor that I heard, um, I don't know if, if Daniel can, might, knows this at all, but uh, what I heard was that he, um was doing stand-up at a casino as like a, a, res- a residency for a little bit like a, for a weekend he did like a few different shows um and he lost a whole bunch of money on a marker and uh and then he had to work there for like another week to pay it off <laughs> totally believe that. that that sounds totally reasonable for sure but yeah big loss for uh for the poker community and and, and sad to see that happen um, just quickly touched on a couple of things. Uh, so the poker masters, we touched on a little bit, uh, Michael Adamo wins the 50, the last two events, he wins the 50 K and the hundred K to take over, uh, take home over 1.8 million, as well as the purple jacket for the, uh, poker masters. Um, Daniel, you were in a decent spot. You won, I think event five, it was the, uh, the 10 K no limit hold'em and, um, you know, laid into the, um, you know, because it's a, the, the purple jacket is is the coveted thing and laid into the series there, you were um, right near the top of the leaderboard and, and had a shot, uh, but pretty sick for a guy to, to win the last two sort of big buying events and, and take it down. Yeah, actually, it, it sort of speaks to the point systems a little bit broken for one specific reason, the 50K. Like when he won the 50K, I had a first and two thirds. That was the first event he played but he was already the point leader. Like he was actually leading just from winning the 50K. So the way the point system works, and I think we're gonna probably have to make a change just for the 50K is this. For the 10K buy-ins, for every $1,000 that you cash for, you get one point. So cash for 10K, you get 10 points, right? For a 25K, you get 0.6 of a point. So if you cash for 100K, you get 60 points. For 100K or above, it's 0.3. So that's, you know, if you cash for 100K, you get 30 points. The problem lies with the 50K specifically, because the 50K is under the same rules as the 25K, so it's 0.6. So even though, I mean, if, you know, they're very similar to the 25Ks, the amount of points you get for a 50K is actually bigger than even the 100K, right? So there's the, the good of that. It, it sort of allows for everybody to still be in the race by the end. But I guess the bad is that, you know, um, you know, just kind of not weighted right. Having said that, the good news is, is Adamo just came home because if he didn't do anything in the last event, he wouldn't have won. So he needed to at least cash in the hundred K and he did so going and st- going away in style. I watched the final table and was envious every single time he got all in against somebody, whether he had 
Well, he had Jack nine and they had King queen. It didn't matter. He won every single one. And you could ask him, he was like, what a weird run of all ins I had. Like, and this is, I don't know. I, part of the reason I track it too is uh, I think the, well, the public at large, is such a massive misconception of like, who's good, who's bad based on, Oh, look, he won. This must be good. This guy must be bad where they don't understand how much variance can play a role. Like if you run, if you sun run, so let's say for example, what I consider a sun run. If you get your money in on average, 50%, let's say equity, and you're hitting 75%, that's a fucking sun run. That's a massive sun run to do that, right? And if you do that, and if you're not winning and you're doing that, holy shit, you got problems with your game, right? Um, it can go the other way too, you know, where you're hitting like 20% in these spots. Um, and I've experienced it, right? But the public, because like, here's the thing, for me, I think I've been playing really, really well for a year, year and a half, like really, really well. But I wasn't getting any results. I was losing to fucking Phil Helmut and shit and, and heads ups, right? So we're like, oh, you must suck, right? And then, um, you know, I wasn't getting any results going. And now that I did, people are like, oh, yeah, you must, you know, playing good now. Like, they don't know. It's not, that's not how it works, right? The hardest thing to do as a professional poker player or poker player in general is continue to have confidence and continue to believe in what you're doing when everything's going wrong. Not your decision making, but like you get kings, they have ace four, and you lose. Like that's going to keep, and when that happens over a while, it takes a toll on anybody. You know, when I went through a pretty rough stretch of that, I have been doing this a long time, so I've experienced it before. And I'm just hopeful that the World Series of Poker, like I told Craig, Harry, we joke around, I'm like, buddy, if I win 50% of flips, you can just mail it in. You know, like we're going to, we're going to crush. Um, I'd take that for the World Series of Poker. But yeah. It's uh, luck is a thing. And listen, I, I'm, that's, I, that may come off as taking something away from Adamo, which is ridiculous because I think he's fabulous. He's an excellent player. If you watch some of what he was doing, he was incredibly super aggressive, a pain in your side, defending every big blind, like nine, five off, whatever, not giving you any breathing room, really had a deep understanding of how to leverage his big stack. You know, he was opening nine deuce off. You know, he really just, he knows what he's doing. He's well-respected in the community by the other pros. He has a unique style. That's like I said, crazy aggressive. Like he doesn't ace four suited. Like he gets in a lot of fucking chips, right? Like there's a lot of people, most people in like four bet, five bet spots are under bluffing. Okay. Most every human being poker player is under bluffing. He's not, <laughs> he is not. I think he's actually balanced. And here's the thing about balanced. Balanced looks insane. Okay. Because if you actually played the way like game theory said you should in these spots, it's fucking nuts because you're supposed to be in most spots have just as many bluffs as many value. Well, I can tell you this in 2004, if I four bet you and you had two Queens and you call, you are a sucker because you're burning chips. Kings is like a crying call to try to flop a set. You know, I've changed my game a little bit since then, but the general principle is true that most people when they five bet or four bet, you're going to be looking at a very, very condensed range with hardly any bluffs. Reminds me of, I think it was like my third main event. I was blind versus blind and I raised with queen jack off and I got three bet and I just decided to stick in a four bet because we're blind versus blind. And I was like a little aggressive back then guy turned over two Queens face up and folded them. It's a good fold. I was like, I mean, against the population, I had the worst conceivable hand you could actually have against two queens, but I was like, <laughs> I just nodded, took the pot before he changed his mind. <laughs> you should have, you, know, you got to, so, at that point, you got to act a little bit and go, what? Like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, how do I not have, you know, whatever. I wasn't you know, veteran savvy know. enough in those days. Yeah. In the main event, um, day two. Uh, blind versus blind. I was in the big blind and it was an old man in the small blind and he raised and I had ace jack off. And I think we're a few hundred big blinds deep. And I managed to, I think I, I don't know, three or four or five, but whatever I did, I got him. I got it all in with ace jack and he had two Kings and it took him the full time to call. He almost folded the two Kings, but I, uh, I ended up going home because he called, but uh, I tried to get him to fold the two Kings, but oh well. Um, all right, uh, let's move on to some tweets, Roscoe P. Coltrane. You're going surfing on the internet. Uh, all around good guy, Phil Galfond. He tweets, uh, a serious issue in the poker community has come to my attention. 
It seems that while many of you considered me superior to Jungle Man Dan, that is uh, Daniel Cates, some actually feel the opposite way. In order to remedy this, I've become his boss and uh, uh, run it once. The, uh, the poker training site that Phil Galfond uh, uh, owns and runs is now employing Mr. Jungle Man to, to uh, provide videos on, uh, on how to play poker, which would be interesting because, you know, as anybody who's ever seen Jungle Man um, try and communicate, he has an uh, interesting style of com communication. So I wonder how that would uh, uh, translate to being a teacher in online poker series. But I guess we'll find out for those who are Run It Once subscribers. But um, some, of the, some of the promotional videos coming out of that were pretty funny. I uh, got a kick out of him with a mask and doing different things. Um, Jeff writes, so this is at Seville 300 ZXTT. So, uh, a long Twitter name there. Poker players can ver uh, remember. Oh, you know what a 300, you, what, you know what 300 ZXTT is? I do not. It's the, it's the Nissan 300 ZX twin turbo. Oh, there you go. Mm. He's got one of those. Uh, uh, poker players can remember virtually everything that happens at a poker table for years and years. We have absolutely zero idea if we tipped a dealer two seconds ago though. Which Not is a problem for Daniel because you you high stakes guys you guys all t t take care of it all separate they don't they don't tip every pot like they do yeah. with the, the well the every stuff. now every time a dealer comes in we uh, whoever wins that pot tips yeah yeah so you wouldn't remember Danny if you played in a lower stakes game where you had to tip every hand you would forget all the time right I never forget stuff like that so if I didn't tip somebody it was intentional. <laughs> <laughs> What would a dealer have to do to not get a tip from Daniel Negrani? Uh, I don't know. There's probably some things, but I, it reminds me of a Sam Grizzle. I'm told so many Sam Grizzles, another guy who passed away, who was the wittiest guy in poker. Yeah. He had to, you know, he was just an old school guy and old school guys gave dealers shit. That's just the way it was. I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying it's right. It just is what it is. Give him shit. Playing. He peed on one of them. No, he didn't. That was Stu Unger you're talking. Oh, okay. I thought it was Sam. Okay. So no, Sam Grizzle, he's in this game. I think he's playing 8160 limit holder or something. He, he loses like, he's got like one chip left in front of him. And he looks at the dealer and he says, hey, dealer, you got an umbrella? The dealer's like, an umbrella? He's like, no, why? He's like, because the next time I tip you, there will be pink and purple elephants flying around the room, pissing on your head. <laughs> like, where the fuck did he come up with that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then, you know, Puggy Pierce, this is crazy. But Puggy Pearson's brother, JC, okay? I used to play poker with him 2040 at the Mirage, Limit Hold'em, okay? At the and he was playing at the Binion Source. There was a rumor that he had every fucking $1 chip in the joint, because, and he was bragged about it, because it was all the money he saved by not tipping these fucking dirty dealers a penny. He hated dealers that much, probably because in his time, some dealers fucked him over, you know, some mechanics back in his day. So he literally took it out on everybody after that, which again, I don't condone. I just find these stories funny as dis yeah, <laughs> funny and disturbing. Uh, our boy, Bart Hansen at Bart Hansen. Uh, is it just me or, or is this the first time that the world series of poker has antes for the pot limit events and no pre ante rounds for the no limit events? Not complaining by the way. Um, which is interesting, right? Like, no, uh, sorry, Pot Limit Hold'em with antes is a completely different game you mean Omaha. Omaha. than Pot Limit. Is it Pot Limit events? Like, I think it's Pot Limit. Remember, they played Pot Limit Hold'em. Well, there's too. no Pot Limit Hold'em at the World Series. At least I don't. There no, it's not. It was gone for oh, years. Yeah, okay. So before, yeah, it had no events. It was the tightest. It was the worst event. So, um, but, but but having an entry or sorry, um, anti events in the Pot Limit events is, is fantastic. Everybody happy about that? I'll tell you, it's crucial. Yeah. especially it's crucial for PLO and I'll tell you why, especially like I like PLO six maps. I don't really, I'm not as big a fan of nine, nine is, you know, problem, but not, not similar to short deck. And we've discussed this before Terrence about how the game is broken from an ICM perspective on bubbles and stuff, because the equities are so close when you can play nine handed PLO and it's a big blind, small blind with no, no ante, right? Nine handed fucking tables that allows a player who has like 15 big blinds, to sit there for like 50 hands without playing a hand and actually being forced to do that because it's actually correct in a lot of spots financially. So, so adding the ante, um, the big blind ante to that, to that formula helps alleviate that issue. Um, the good news is, is the, it doesn't make the game bigger pre-flop because the ante's dead. So when you make your raises, it's still three and a half times the big, you can't use the ante after the flop. 
whatever's in the pot counts. So the ante will count post flop. That makes so a lot of sense. I think that's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To Dan, to Daniel's point, I remember cashing in a PLO eight event with something like two and a half blinds, or maybe even less than that. And the guy who busted, the guy who was the stone bubble, was actually at my table on my exact right, and he was in the small blind. And you know, he's so he's got he's actually got more chips than me. Put the rest of his chips in with I think something like Ace Deuce three six double suited. Absolutely terrible play. Yeah. Right. So he had like six big five big blinds with with an absolute premium hand for PLO eight. But it's still wrong to do it because I'm at the table with slightly less than him and some other guys at some other table with a little bit less than him. And it's just it's it, it is really, really awful. I mean, yeah, the kind of poker that, you know, rewards that sort of stuff, which is what happens in these spots. I've always hated. That's why I don't like super satellites. I don't like situations where it's correct to fold pocket aces. Right. Because in super satellites, there's absolutely spots where cause people always say, would you fold pocket aces? I'm like, never. But I guess in a super satellite, you're supposed to. Yeah. You know, just so stupid. Like, you know, I, I just don't like that. And PLO, like you said, like you're just handcuffed. If you, so if you're me, you don't give a shit. I'm just going to play. Like if I get ACE 36, I'm going to go with it because I don't give a fuck about min, min cash, right? I'm trying to win, give myself the But for most people who play poker for money, doing that is just lighting money on fire. And that shouldn't be the case, right? Because what it does is it forces, let's say, for example, you're five out of the money, okay? And there's like, 20 guys sitting on 20 bigs ish, right? By the time that bubble bursts, okay, those 20 guys are going to have like six bigs, five bigs. So what it does, it's, it's almost like, so AOC would hate this fucking model because what happens is the rich get richer. The chip leaders just continue to fucking accumulate while everybody else just suffers more and more and more. So she would not be a fan of this uh, lack of distribution. Of well, and, that, and that's and that's not even accounting the stalling that occurs. That you know, so and that's that's a separate issue. But that makes it even worse because the the play after that is just really really shallow. What would I say? But, but she'd go to a party with the chip leaders. <laughs> yeah, right. tax the chip leaders. <laughs> uh, all right, moving on to uh, Alex Jacob, uh, poker player turned uh, Jeopardy champion. Uh, imagine being any any. Uh, quote tweeting the World Series of Poker who talks about not um, wearing masks. You don't have to wear masks if you're fully vaccinated at the World Series of Poker this year. Uh, imagine being so anti-mask uh, anti that you have the option to conceal your face at the poker table, but you absolutely refuse to do it. <laughs> Which is funny, right? Because, um, you know, these, these Germans who wear like turtlenecks up to their face and stuff, um, but some people won't wear a mask even though they're allowed to do so. So... Uh, pretty funny there. Yeah, I mean, it depends on a comfort thing. I mean, I think probably for like, I'm certainly not going to wear a mask in like the first four levels of the 1500 limit hold'em when I play the event because I don't want to. But should I get like heads up against Daniel Negreanu, probably going to throw the mask on just just for the heck of it because hey, I want to win. Like I don't know. <laughs> I wanted to say too. Like I have a deep respect for like people in the medical industry or whatever that have to wear a mask 14 hours a day because doing it just for a couple of weeks at poker masters every day. Like I notice, like, I feel like almost like a, when I'm, when I have it on like a shortness of breath, sometimes you just gotta take a real breath, you know, that's not like regurgitated air. And it's so important like to wear a fresh mask too. And I don't know that everyone does that because if you wear an old mask, you're like, you're basically inhaling and smelling fucking yesterday's, you know, garlic pasta or whatever, which is not ideal, right? So, so I get why people would not want to wear them from a comfort perspective, but I get Jacob's point. It's like, so everybody's trying to wear sunglasses, hats, hoodies, and whatever. Now you can literally legally cover your face, but you won't do it, even though it's probably more profitable for you to uh, avoid giving off tells. Uh, all right, that's going to wrap it up for the tweets. We do have a giveaway this week, and we've talked about it in the previous shows um nfts are all the rage and daniel uh you went to OpenSea and with some developers you set up uh a, a series of 12 nfts and this is orange background upside down white flag in corner for those that don't remember an original very original okay. they're one of they're one of a well they're one of 12 they're in on the ground these people there's 12 that's you know that's like you know how many freaking nfts they usually make 100 just 12 we've made of this special edition could you imagine being the first person to own one of these like how special that is especially when you resell it 1.5 million is the current value 
but that's only going to go up. So you're now right. you're talking, you resell at 1.8, 2.5. But for most people, the art is so beautiful, they're going to want to hold on to it, right? So we're, because that Pelker podcast, we're well funded here. You know, we're funded by, by the uh, orange Gee, background, white flag in the corner that um, we're able to go ahead and uh, donate one to uh, a lucky uh, listener, right, Adam? We're going to do that. So we're going to give away one. We talked about uh, how to do this. We're going to give away eight of these, I think. Four, four of us are each going to have one um, in case these things are worth uh, millions of dollars because they're going to, let's face it, these are going to be worth more than CryptoPunks in pretty short order, right? Wait till you see the freaking next batch that comes out. Oh, my God. I got fucking ideas over here. Okay. So uh, we're going to give one away. And today, uh, this one I sent out on Twitter. If you, By the way, if you don't follow us on Twitter, this is how you're going to find out how these are given away. Um, on Twitter, let's everybody roll, do a roll call. I'm at A. Schwartz Poker, at T. Chan Poker, at Real Kid Poker, and at Producer Ross. These are all our Twitter handles. So you can follow us to, fo to find out what is the criteria for the giveaway of these um, eight uh, NFTs. And this week it was leave a five-star iTunes review or, or a review on your um, podcast provider uh, for our show. This helps us, you know, uh, move up the ranks, et cetera. And we randomly chose uh, a winner from this group of people. And it was, uh, who was it, by the way? So it was... Um, number five. <laughs> we said it was number five. You said, five. It, you said the name. No, it was number six. I think you said, oh, no, it was five. Ooh. You're right. Um, and it was uh, Bone Dango Stick. Oh. It was Bone Dango Stick who says, Bed post, best podcast ever. Uh, listen to Rounders, 2 plus 2, uh, best ever, etc. He talked about how great we are. Uh, a Bone Dango Stick is the winner of the very first giveaway of uh, Upside or oh, sorry, Orange Background, Upside Down, White Flag, and Corner. I've got to get correct. it right. You have to get that right. Orange Background, Upside Down, White Flag, and Corner. Uh, you win uh, uh, number five, I believe, is what number you're going to win of this uh, iteration. Ooh, of that's a good one. Number five. Oh, fuck. Number five. That's, that's a good one. I'm just saying, like, because I know on the thing in the grid, like, the five is placed so fucking perfectly. Like, you you did good, Bo. Bo, man, you got number five. Holy shit. That might be the best one. Pretty oh, sure. So, talking about NFTs, Terrence, or Terrence, uh, Daniel, you bought uh, a whole, you spent some money on some NFTs. What's happened with that? I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I listen, my guy, he buys them. I'm showing them over here. The Gary V like, I mean, it's him drawing and they're like, it's just the ugliest fucking things you could ever imagine. Just the fucking. Well, it's a good thing you didn't spend very much money on it. 250,000 we bought. Yeah, what's that? And it was worth like 350 within a few hours. I don't know what they're doing now or what we're doing with them or whatever, but I don't understand it. But I mean, I do, listen, I do understand it but I don't get it. Does that make sense? Like I understand it. I understand the whole thing, but I don't get, I don't get how and why um, people would want to hold them. Right. Like, so I get how this is working for a lot of people where they see, you know, it's a business investment, you know, but people that actually are wanting this and they're willing to spend like a million dollars to own a rock, you know, Picture just of a they rock. have Picture a, of a rock. It's but I've heard rock. like, so I've been learning more about it and it's a little bit more like people, because people were coming at me. Uh, it was like, someone sent me this picture of an ape and they're like, you could have this ape. Right. And I was like, I just took a screenshot of the ape and now it's in my phone. And I did that for free. It didn't cost me a fucking penny. And they're like, yeah, but it's just not the original. I'm like, I don't give a shit. It looks exactly the same. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't even want to, I own it. I'm not going to resell it. I love it as is. They're like, so they were trying to explain to me a little bit more about how owning one of these things is like you're part of a community now, right? And I think that's like the future of NFTs is really kind of community building where everyone who has an ape or everyone who has a rock, they're part of the gang, you know, like the ape gang or whatever you want to call these different people. Like for oh, my boy John Juwanda, he's a D-Gen fucking ape freak. He's all about him. He just can't stop buying these D-Gen apes and shit. So, um, so yeah, I guess from that perspective, you know, you, you get where it's going. What will happen to this shit in four or five years? I have no idea, but I'm, I'm worried for people. I think that there could be like, because everyone's trying to create this new NFT line. 95% are probably going to be worth zero, I would imagine. And only like a select few will make it. Well, except orange background, upside down, white flag. Oh, this is, we're talking obvious cream of the crop type shit though. That was like straight from this mind to you. It's like by you, by owning this now, orange background, white flag in the, in the corner, 
You own a piece of my existence, of yeah. my brain, of my mind. You have an extension of me, right? And all my wealth that I've accumulated. So that's partly yours now because you own this orange background, white flag in the corner. By the way, these aren't open sea. This isn't like a, you know, we're sending you some sort of uh, joke. This is real. So oh, yeah, it's an NFT now. Yeah, it's an NFT. Uh, Roscoe, we, I know we have some voicemails. Why don't you pick the best one? We ran a little late here because, you know, we had a full agenda of five lines of things to talk about for this week. But um, why don't you uh, give us your pick of the best voicemail of the week? Okay. Uh, before we do that, I just came up with an idea for next week. Oh, good. Um, I've been I've been playing with the idea of of starting an an Instagram for the for the podcast for a while. So I think maybe we should jumpstart that. Yes. And I can I I've just made I've just reserved the uh, the screen name at Dat Poker Pod on Instagram, and I'll start putting some uh, some show content there that people who don't have Twitter can discuss the uh, the the content with us, and then we can uh, next week select a random follower. To, to, to receive a so that that's going to be next week's giveaway yeah uh, uh the nft uh upside down something or other the orange background in the in all you have to do is follow at that poker pod on instagram follow at just some bot from russia well maybe uh, you should probably make them put tweet a hashtag or something yeah yeah maybe okay i'll i'll, I'll, I'll think of it and put you'll, put, you'll figure I'll, it out i'll put, I'll put it in a post it, on instagram. it can be a comment on the post you make yeah there we yeah, go yeah comment yeah Okay. Good news, I just wanted to, since we're like leaving out the podcast, this is happening in real time. But the package for those disaffected, the 1,500 people, is up. They're, they, we, we gave them a separate uh, private password link, and they're buying pieces. I'm selling it actually through the, you guys remember, like Pocket Fives. Yeah. So pocketfives.com is where we're hosting it with no you know, uh, transaction fees or anything like that for the people, which is great. So it looks like people are buying, and uh, I'm going to be working for you all at no markup, unlike – Bump, well, this would make the podcast another hour long, but unlike what we're seeing on Twitter, once again, every year this happens. I'm selling myself like by 1.5, 2, and I've won this yeah. and I've won that. Andrew Barber is always the one that's like anti this, but I'm like free market, go for what you want. But I think this year, especially, like people selling at 1.5 for a mixed game event, like when the numbers should be down. I mean, that's strong, bro. I saw 2.0 for mixed events today, and I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah, that's. Crazy. <laughs> um, right, what do you got for the, our best? Uh, I, I, best I don't. I, there was a few that came in last week. I, I, I can't remember exactly, but we'll uh, we'll just try one. Try a random one. Let's go. Okay. Email number one. Hey there, Leon from Southeast England in the UK. Question around training sites. Now there seems to be a lot of these around at the moment. BBZ run it once. Raise your edge, upswing, etc., etc. I've been through Daniel's masterclass a couple of times and I found that really helpful. I'm looking to improve my game and it's kind of difficult to decide which one I want to go on without spending hundreds of dollars across different sites. So I'm wondering if you guys have any advice around that or any experience with any of these. Uh, that'd be appreciated. Thanks. So that's a really hard question, right? Because anybody who would want to um, recommend one over the other would have to be a member of all these different training sites. And, and that becomes such a giant time consuming event because like I'm a member of Run It Once and I love Run It Once. I think they're great. They have more volume than I can ever imagine to watch. So for me to say, you know, one's better than the other, it's impossible for me. Um, I, I just will tell you that I think Run It Once is awesome and I love all the content and I can't get to anywhere near the amount of content they have uh, to help my poker game. But everything I, I see on them is great. I don't know about you guys. Don't most of them have a free trial? I mean, I don't know that they all do. I know Run It Once does. I don't I, I would imagine most of them have some sort of free trial so you can at least watch a couple of videos that they make available for free, see whose styles that you like. I, I, I mean, that would be the way to go. I think uh, you, you, you should, you should definitely check everything because I mean, just because somebody is the best player doesn't mean they're the best coach. And just because somebody's best coach doesn't mean they're the right coach for you. It's all about sort of the way that you learn in the style that you learn. But um, yeah, I don't have further thoughts on that. I'm sure Brennan wants is good. Daniel, do you have any thoughts? Well, what about poker VT? I think poker VT. Oh, might... That's old. Yeah. That was, that was before it's time, but they actually, you know, even the Solve for Why guys, they start, they did this thing called Poker Out Loud, which is essentially exactly the same thing we did. 
many years ago. But yeah, I think it's a really tough question. And I, and I wish we had, I wish I had a more solid answer for you, but like in order for me, typically when I endorse something, like I want to have actually experienced it myself and compared it to other things as well. Right. And I, I haven't, you know, I, I work with the guys that I work with from hybrid poker. Um, they're, I don't even know if they're launched yet publicly. Like they do things behind the scenes and they have like private clients and stuff. So I have experience with them, you know, and I can, you know, I can honestly say that they do an excellent job coaching and teaching. But as far as uh, the other ones, like I would hate to say, I think people do this too often. You know, it's essentially called talking out of your ass, right? Like, I just don't know. Like, I don't know which ones are better than the others because I, I don't have a subscription to any of them. So it would basically be me, you know, suggesting based on the people involved, you know, and I trust Phil Galfon, of course, you know, and, you know, Jason Coons on there and stuff. So those are obviously good sources um, that I would imagine are delivering good content. Um, as far as books go there, you know, a lot of people were asking me on my stream. I did start reading it because um, I thought it was, you know, really very explaining a lot of the concepts we were talking about earlier. And that's uh, modern uh, poker theory by Michael Acevedo. It's uh, really good. You know, for those that want to read, <laughs> I don't know if there's any people like that left, but it's a very, very sort of, it might seem intimidating because there's a lot of math there, but don't worry about that. Just understand the concept. And then you, you know, you'll get the math stuff down later, but I, yeah, I wish I could give you a better answer to that. But again, it would require me like being a member to all these different options. And I haven't been. What about this book? Uh, uh, yeah. Like Not a fan. Great. <laughs> Uh, all right, that's going to wrap it up for the week. Uh, thanks to uh, no, no orange flag, uh, no orange flag, no white flag on orange background for Ross. No, <laughs> not winning. You can't, uh, yeah, can't thanks, get a laugh every uh, time. Uh, thanks to everybody out there. Crowd. Thanks to you guys for getting together. Uh, we'll get, uh, we'll sneak one in here before the World Series of Poker starts uh, with any sort of uh, news and updates that happen, um, and then we'll catch up with uh, Dana's preparation. Um, and uh, yeah, everybody have a good week and we'll talk to you soon.